Theodore F. once said, On my desk at work, I have a sign which reminds me of this. It says, Perhaps today. On my desk at home, I have a sign which reminds me of this. It says, Watch and pray. We need reminders to keep our attention focused on the possibility that Christ can come back at any time. Concentrating on this blessed hope will do many things for our attitudes, faithfulness, actions, and reactions. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to continue our study on prophecies of the Bible, and we're going to finish up the rest of the New Testament, getting us ready for Revelation. We're going to start that right after this. Hey everyone, welcome again to Connecting the Gap. I'm Daniel Moore, your host for this podcast. Thank you once again for joining me this week. Please go to my website, connectingthegap.net, and there you can find all of my podcast platforms that I'm on, my Rumble channel, my YouTube channel. And if you've never checked out the podcasting app Edify, that's E-D-I-F-I, you might want to check that out. If you're a Christian conservative person that really enjoys Christian content only, and you don't want to pick through all the other noise that a lot of the other podcasting platforms have, check out Edify. All that's on there is Christian podcast from a biblical worldview, and it's current events stuff, Bible studies, just all kinds of things. There's just endless amounts of podcasting material on that app, and you can check that out at edify.app on the internet, or you can go to your uh, Play Store, your iPhone and Google Play Stores, and check out those and download those apps to your mobile devices. And we are on that app. Everyone that's on Edify has to be approved by the people that run that app source, and uh, they double-check that, make sure everything is biblically sound and that everything that goes on there is geared towards the Christian believers. So go check that out today as we're on there as well. Wow, it's been quite a week, and uh, this is going to probably be a little bit longer podcast because today I'm going to go ahead and finish up the rest of the New Testament to get us ready for Revelation next week, and that's going to kick off a whole new segment of studies that we're going to be going in through a while because we're going to do a pretty deep dive into Revelation, and so we're going to do that here shortly. But of course, before that happens, I just wanted to mention that you know this last week has been pretty rough in some ways, and it's been great in others. Uh, we know that the Second Amendment was kind of uh, voted on this last week in a certain way, and as conservatives and Second Amendment supporters, we kind of lost a, f- a little bit of ground in that with some of our Republicans even flipping on that. that. Not to say that that whole bill was bad, but there's just certain parts in it that I believe gave the government a little bit too much control over our guns and the things that us as law-abiding gun owners are able to do. Um, but then on the flip side of that, we had Roe versus Wade overturned. And, you know, it's been amazing to me. I, I made a little post about this on my Facebook page. I kind of held off for a little bit because I was kind of watching all the reactions that happened after that overturned um, this last week. And my goodness, there's a lot of people that I really thought had a, a more solid foundation biblically under them that has blown my mind in the ways that they look at that and their beliefs on what they can and can't do with human life. And I know that this is a very touchy, a very hot subject, and I'm not going to you know, stay on it too long here this morning as we get started. But I do want to say that I think it comes down to, to the biblical foundation and the thoughts of this. God is our creator. God created each and every person for a purpose. The Bible tells us that he breathed life into us, that we are created in God's image. Therefore, God has supreme power and rule over us and over our lives. And if you've been following the study that we've been in on Prophecy of the Bible, you will see that God has had a direct impact in ruling his people's lives ever since the beginning has begun. He is the one that created everything, and so therefore he is our God and our supreme ruler. If you go to a king or a queen or a president and they put something into place, Can you overrule that person as an individual and tell them what to do 
and change what they have in plan and put into place. That never happens. The same thing happens with God. God creates every individual person in the womb, whether it's from a bad situation or if it's something that's planned. It does not matter. That person in that womb had life breathed into it by our Heavenly Father. We do not have the right, therefore, to go over his head and overrule him and take that life away and not allow that life to be born into this earth. God has a purpose for every person that has ever been created in the womb or out of the womb. And that is the part that a lot of people don't get. They don't understand. They get mad because of rape and sodomy and all these other kinds of things that happens. And I totally understand that. But sin is the reason that all of that happens. And who created sin? It was not God. It was Adam and Eve, the human beings that he created perfect and put into a perfect world. They are the ones that messed that up. And now we pay the price for that as time moves on through eternity. And it's, it's not going to stop until he comes back. Satan has his rule over this earth. He runs rampant to and fro. The Bible tells us that he does that, seeking whom he may devour. He is a roaring lion, and therefore we are going to be putting up with this sinful stuff until the day that we pass away or until the Lord comes back. That still does not give us the right to change the Bible, to change the Word. There's nobody out there that can give me any scripture that says God is okay with taking babies' lives when they're in the womb. There's no scripture that backs that up. If you truly believe there is a God, you truly believe the Bible is God's word, then you totally go against anything that you believe when you believe that you can take a baby's life and and decide its fate all in your own hands. That is not how this works. If we follow God's word and his principles and the thing that he's put into uh, the Bible as a guideline for how we should live on a daily basis, there would not be any homeless kids. There would not be kids in foster care that have no families or nobody that wants to adopt them. There would not be the rape and the incest and the sodomy and all the other things that are going on creating illegitimate babies that shouldn't be here or being born out of wedlock. All of that comes from from sin and all of that sin is a choice that we make and the lifestyle that we make and I just pray for each and every person out there right now that's struggling with this there's a lot of hatred going on uh, on social media it, I almost can't even read it because people that were friends and like each other are bashing each other right now and you know not acting like friends at all it's probably going to put a, a severe divide and a split in some friendships and between some family members and you know it's just not worth it we all have one life to live here and we all should be thankful for the life that god gives each of us if our parents had been pro-abortion and they did not want us to be here you would not be here listening to this right now have you enjoyed your life are you glad that you've been able to be a part of this life to have the husband or the spouse or the boyfriend or the girlfriend or the kids the grandkids all the things that you've been blessed with in this life have you enjoyed that you are enjoying that because your parents chose to let you have life and there's so many babies out there that will never ever get that choice because us as a human race decided to be god and play god's part and overrule god and what he had planned and take that life away and unfortunately, for those people that have done that, there's going to be a severe price to pay when eternity comes. And we know that that's getting very close. As we've been going through the study on prophecies of the Bible, it's been very obvious that these are very dark days that we are living in right now. And all of the prophetic things from the beginning of the Bible to where we're at right now is coming true and has been coming true for years and been coming to fruition. It's hard to deny the fact that God's word is real and that it does stand today firm as a foundation that we should believe in. So I just pray for each person out there uh, that's having one side or the other of this battle if it's somebody that's really angry or if it's someone that's happy but is being slammed by someone else you know i understand that each side doesn't want their agendas pushed on the other but you know we're getting agendas pushed on us as christians all the time that we don't like it's hard to even watch tv right now without seeing rainbows and transgender and everything else splashed across our screens we don't like that either that stuff's getting forced down our throat so really it's equal uh, equal battle there, I guess, as far as the way to look at that, because everybody keeps saying, well, you know, you pro-life people shouldn't have your agenda shoved down our throat. Well, we've got to deal with a lot of stuff that the other side shoves down our throats as well. That's part of living in this sinful earth. That's part of being here in this time that we live, and it's not going to get any better. We just need to pray, 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 and pray that God comes back soon 
gets us out of this place and that we can get to that new life and that new heaven, that new earth that he's promised us as Christians as we go on into eternity living for him. And I pray that each person that ever listens to this podcast right now comes to a realization that Christ is important, we need him in our lives, and we're not going to make it into eternity without him. So I'm going to go ahead and get into this because we've got a little bit of material to cover. As I said, this will probably be a longer podcast today, um, but I do want to get through the rest of the New Testament here. We're going to be starting in James today in our study on prophecies of the Bible. And we're going to be in James chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. In this portion of scripture here, everyone who has money would do well to listen to the scathing rebuke of the rich that's taking place here in James. God is not against people having money, but he is against people permitting money to interfere with their relationship with him. Here he tells the rich who hoard wealth for the last days to cry because misery awaits them. When he says your riches are corrupted, there in James 5, chapter 2, he means the time will come when it will be worthless. Even good clothes and precious metals will be worthless. When the tribulation period arrives, one's riches will be worthless. And when the judgment comes, one's riches could very well be evidence that they did not give to the poor, evidence of greed and selfishness, evidence that will cause the awesome judgment of God to fall on them. William Barclay was quoted, Now the point is that gold and silver do not actually rust, so James, in the most vivid way, is warning men that even the most precious and even the most apparently indestructible things are doomed to decay and to dissolution. The rust is proof of the impermanence and the ultimate valuelessness of all earthly things. The Life Application Bible Commentary puts it this way, Their hoarding will not only demonstrate their wrong priorities, it will also show how their actions deprive the needy of help and resources that could have been given. James has already pointed out that judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. That's James chapter 2, verse 13. In the last days, people will hoard gold and silver, stocks and bonds, food and other things in an effort to provide a safety net for themselves during hard times. But the riches they so dearly trust in will become a snare because ultimately only those who trust in God will be safe. Jesus asked, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? It will be useless to hoard treasures during the tribulation period. Theft will be a major problem. People will stop buying gold, silver, and fine clothes. A day's wages will not buy enough food. And one's works, not wealth, will be the basis of judgment when the books are opened at the great white throne. With the second coming looming on the horizon, one would be wise to use his wealth to help the poor and to give to those doing the work of God. The comforts of this world will be short-lived, but the rewards for sharing will last forever. The decisions people make are very important. Those who don't ask Christ to be their sin bearer will be raised in the resurrection of the lost and have their sins fully exposed. Some of what James said is as follows. In James chapter 1 verse 15, he says evil desires produce sin and sin will lead to the second death. In James chapter 2 verse 10, he says the person who breaks just one commandment is guilty of breaking all the laws of God. In James chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, God will not be merciful to those who have not shown mercy. God wants his people to serve and worship him in spirit and in truth. Those who do will participate in his coming kingdom on earth, and believers who have humbled themselves before God, shown faith, and loved him will inherit the kingdom. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, it says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Every Christian should have patience. When the Bible talks about patience, it usually refers to being patient with people, but here it means being patient about the rapture. James asks us to consider how the Jewish farmer waits on the land to produce a valuable crop. 
He sows his crop in the fall and waits for the autumn rain to make the seed sprout. He works long and hard to tend the crop and waits for the spring rain to provide moisture for the grain to fill out. James says this is the kind of patience and endurance that is needed for the rapture. And he advises Christians to settle their differences because Jesus will return and we will be judged. It takes a long time for seed to sprout and produce a crop, but it happens. Likewise, Jesus will return. The pulpit commentary states, Think, he says, of the long-suffering of the farmer. His is a life of arduous toils and anxious delays. He must wait for the early rain in the late autumn before he can sow his seed, and for the latter rain in April, upon which his crops depend for filling of the ear before the harvest ripens. This patience is necessary. Although sometimes sorely tried, it is reasonable. The fruit which the farmer desires is precious. It is worth waiting for. The concept of the imminent return of Christ should impact our lives. It should motivate those who are living in sin to abandon their sin. It should motivate Christians to settle disputes, pray, and do good works. Is the nearness of his return and the approaching judgment affecting you? The farmer cannot plant a crop one day and harvest it the next. He must be patient, allowing nature to do its work. Then he receives a valuable reward. In like manner, Christians cannot expect to be saved today and raptured to heaven tomorrow. We must be patient, have hope, and let Jesus prepare the way. Then he will return. We will receive the treasures we have hope for. Jesus said over and over again to watch for his any moment return. Some people have been watching all their lives, and a few are ready to give up. If we do wait, there are going to be some rewards for the faithful people. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, The Christian who perseveres under trial will receive a crown of life. In James chapter 1, verse 25, it says, The person who chooses to keep commandments of God will be blessed. We're now going to move to 1 Peter, and we're going to start in chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here in these scriptures, Peter prepares Jewish and Gentile believers for triumph over suffering by emphasizing seven key truths of Christianity. The first truth is in 1 Peter 1, 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a phrase that the Apostle Paul used also. It reveals that God holds the position of Father in the Trinity. That's a word not found in the Bible, but it refers to the idea that God exists in three ways, as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus holds the position of Son. The second truth here is according to his abundant mercy. That's 1 Peter 1, verse 3. It refers to the fact that we cannot save ourselves, raise ourselves from the dead, take ourselves to heaven, but these things will happen because God decided to have mercy on us. The third truth is has begotten us again to a living hope. This is something Jesus taught when he told Nicodemus that he must be born again if he wanted to see the kingdom of God. Among other things, it means God changes lives and also people to start over again. The fourth troop, hope through the resurrection of Jesus. This means we have proof that God can raise the dead and reason to believe he will raise us. The fifth truth, inheritance. It refers to eternal life in heaven, a place that can never be defiled, damaged, or destroyed. The sixth truth, kept by the power of God, means no matter what happens to us in this life, God has provided a way to protect us in the future. Seventh, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This means he has provided a way to rescue Christians from the time of judgment. We will be rescued before the tribulation period and protected from judgment at the great white throne. So according to Peter, Christians should rejoice for three main reasons. Number one, the grief in our trials of life is only temporary. The hardships will be done away with, giving us much to look forward to. Secondly, the trials of life are God's way of testing us. 
He does not permit them out of a desire to hurt us. He permits them because they will help us grow as Christians and bring more praise to him. And thirdly, the trials of life will make us stronger, equip us to endure even greater hardships, and prepare us to meet Christ at his coming. The new birth is something God does for everyone who sincerely accepts Jesus as their Savior. The Holy Spirit works in people's lives to bring about changes according to the will of God. The born-again person develops a new character, a desire to please God, a new set of priorities and values, and a hope for the future. Experience the new birth and you will be brought into the kingdom of God. Death delivers all Christians from the hardships and dangers of this world, and the rapture will deliver living Christians from the greatest period of distress that the world has ever known. All the signs indicate that this deliverance is near. When Jesus catches up his church, it will move from earth to heaven, and each member will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Believers should maximize their commitment and prepare for the rewards. In 1 Peter 1.13, it states, Believers should prepare for the grace to be given when Christ raptures the church. In 1 Peter 4.5, it says all believers will be judged. 1 Peter 4.7 says Jesus can return at any moment, so believers should be self-controlled and clear-minded and should pray. 1 Peter 4, 13 and 14 says, The Holy Spirit rests on believers who suffer for Christ. They will receive a future inheritance. 1 Peter 4, verse 17 says, Believers will be judged first, but the unbelievers will suffer more. 1 Peter 5, 1 says, Believers will share in the glory of God at the rapture. And 1 Peter 5, 4 states, Believers who remain faithful under trial will receive a crown of glory when Christ returns. After the millennium, all those who have refused to accept Jesus as their Savior, dead or alive, small or great, in hell, on earth, or under the earth, will appear before the great white throne of God for a judgment of their works. There will be degrees of punishment, but no salvation for any of these. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, it says, All unbelievers will be judged. Moving on to 2 Peter, we look at chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. It says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here in this passage of scripture, Peter declares that he and the apostles did not invent stories about the second coming of Jesus. He states that he and the apostles were eyewitnesses to what Jesus will be like when he returns in glory. He was referring to the appearance of Jesus when he was transfigured when his appearance was drastically changed on the mountain. But they not only saw this, they heard God honor and glorify Jesus by speaking from heaven about his love for his son. Peter continued by reminding us that we not only have the apostolic, which is from the apostles, assurance of the second coming, we also have the assurances of the prophets. In fact, we have so much evidence, we would be wise to heed these things until the day Jesus returns. He is the light of the world and the bright morning star. You can read about that in Revelation 2, verse 28, and Revelation 22, verse 16. The Life Application Bible Commentary states, Thus all that the apostles taught and wrote, even regarding the awesome power of Christ and the promise of his second coming, was grounded in experience and fact without embellishment or speculation. The believers must always remember that the truth they received was truth indeed, passed on by those who had lived with and learned from Jesus. The transfiguration of Jesus gave the disciples a brief glimpse into the future. It was God's way of providing them with information about the second coming so they could pass it on to the world and assure us it will happen. It is evidence that when the prophet said is true, people would be wise to pay attention. Those who live for God will receive a rich welcome into his kingdom. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, it says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Knowing this first, 
means this is a high priority item. It may not seem very important, but it is. The last days of the church age will be characterized by people mocking the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Their apostasy will generate from evil desires and come in the form of a scoffing question. Why hasn't Jesus returned like he promised? Then they will pretend to prove that he will not return with a ridiculous argument. Nothing they will say has changed since the beginning of the earth. Dave Hunt was quoted, The apostasy involves claiming that revival rather than the rapture is imminent and denying that apostasy must come. Again, these days are upon us, and we need not quote the many Christian leaders who ridicule belief in the rapture, calling it an escape theory. Their books and tapes are readily available. Here is one reason why Jesus has not already returned. Peter said, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Both the Old and New Testament repeat the promise of the second coming over and over again. At one time, all the major denominations accepted it, believed it, and preached it. But many will not even talk about it today. What does this tell us about the signs of the times? Apostate teachers have taken over many of our religious institutions. They are denying not only the virgin birth, the iner inerrancy of the scriptures, and other long-held beliefs, but also the once esteemed doctrine of the second coming. If they do not die first, many of these apostates will be the beginning of the false church that will be so prevalent during the first half of the tribulation period. Dozens of prophetic signs indicate that the tri tribulation period is drawing near, but man's attempt to ignore or discredit Bible prophecy is one of the most prominent. Many pulpits are occupied by people who choose to deny the absolutes of the Bible, some of the fruit of their ministry is false prophets and teachers will lead many astray, and they will be punished. And that's stated in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 10. Like ravening wolves, the enemies of God will infiltrate the people of God to lead people astray. But distorting the scriptures will not prevent the future judgment. Following God through Jesus is the only safe path. In 2 Peter 2, 9, it states God knows how to hold the unrighteous for judgment. And in 2 Peter 2, 17, it says severe punishment is reserved for the wicked. We're now going to move on to 1 John as we continue on this week on Connecting the Gap. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Here we have three great truths. The first is that believers already are children of God. We do not hope to be saved or hope to go to heaven. We can dogmatically, positively, and emphatically declare that we are saved and we are going to heaven. We have what some call a no-so salvation. This is truth because God said it. The second truth is that it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. People ask, will I look like a teenager in heaven, an older person, or what will I look like? Well, the answer is this is something God has not yet revealed, so we do not know. We probably wouldn't understand it even if we did. The third great truth is that we will be like the glorified God when he returns. He will come down from heaven, raise the dead, believers, and transform every believer's body into a glorious body like his. This is something we cannot explain, but we know it will be wonderful. David Hawking was quoted, If we can't get excited about this, we simply don't understand what it means. We will be supernaturally, fantastically, gloriously transformed, like a caterpillar that possesses the DNA of a butterfly. We will go through a supernatural metamorphosis that will transform us into what he made our new nature to be. J. Vernon McGee said, This does not mean that all of us who are going to be little robots are simply duplicates. It is not that at all. We will be like him, but with our own personalities, our own individualities, our own selves. He will never destroy the person of Vernon McGee. He'll not destroy the person that you are, but he is going to bring you up to the full measure, the stature where you will be like him, not identical to him, but like him. So following the resurrection of Jesus, he suddenly appeared inside a locked room and showed the disciples his hands inside. On another occasion, he appeared and ate with them. And on yet another occasion, he gave them some instructions and then ascended into heaven. What it means to be like him is a mystery. 
but it does definitely sound exciting. Believers are the children of God right now, but new bodies are needed before we can be like Christ. We will receive them when the church is raptured. Christians have a special relationship with Jesus. He is the head of the church, and it is his body or bride. He sacrificed his blood for the church and has entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven to make intercession for it. Christians have nothing to fear when the church is raptured. Some of John's teachings are as follows. In 1 John 2.28, it states the faithful will not be ashamed when they stand before Christ at his coming. 1 John 4.17 says because believers demonstrate the love of Christ, they will not be afraid at judgment. 2 John 1.8 states every believer should strive for a full reward. So evidence of nearing tribulation period can be seen in a growing opposition to Jesus and his teachings. Instead of interpreting scripture in light of scripture, the emphasis will be put on inclusiveness and pluralism. In 1 John 2.18 it states, Believers will know the last days have arrived because of the opposition to Christ. We are seeing that now on a rampant basis, minute by minute every day. 1 John chapter 4 verse 3, false prophets and teachers will arise and deny that Jesus came from God. And you can also see a lot of that just by going to YouTube and social media and listening to a lot of pastors that preach sermons today and how they've twisted all of the scriptures. So all of this is coming to pass right before our very eyes. We're now going to go ahead and get into Jude and this will wrap up this week on Connecting the Gap. And in Jude chapter 6. It says, The angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. It's going to be an interesting day in court. Many people are concerned about the future of mankind. Satan and his fallen angels are winning spiritual battles all over the planet, and some worry that they will win the war. But the Bible teaches that they will be defeated, judged, and stripped of their power forever. It even teaches that some have already been locked in a dark dungeon called the Abyss, and that the time will come when believers will judge them. Southwest Radio Church stated the angels who left their estate in heaven knew the God who created them. They knowingly and willingly made a choice to follow Satan. Therefore, there is no redemption for fallen angels. So imagine this. It will be spookier than walking through a haunted house at night. No horror film can do it justice. You will be in a courtroom when one of the grossest, most evil demons of the underworld is brought before you to be judged. You will face him and declare his fate. There seems to be two classes of fallen angels. The worst have been locked in the subterranean dungeon or beneath the earth's surface called the abyss. Those not so bad are roaming loose on the earth, deceiving people and causing great harm. Believers will judge these angels during the millennium and have them cast into the lake of fire. The end of this matter is this. Jesus will come back when he gets ready and nothing can stop it. In Jude 14, it says, Jesus will return with thousands upon thousands of saints. In Jude 15, it says, The ungodly will be judged for wrongdoing and speaking against Jesus. Spiritually corrupt pastors and leaders create their own doctrines and impose them upon the church. The apostates will be thrown into hell. That's stated in Jude chapter 13. So that's going to wrap up this episode of Connecting the Gap this week. Thank you once again for joining me, and I hope that you've enjoyed our study so far on prophecies of the Bible as we are wrapping up the entire Bible at this point up to Revelation. Next week we will get started in our study of Revelation, and we will probably do 30-minute portions this next round to get through it because the study is pretty much as long as the prophecies of the bible study was and so i want to try to cut that down just a little bit so we'll probably try to do around 30 minute installments in our episodes from this day forward until we get through revelation but i hope that you guys are excited about that i hope that you've enjoyed this study so far if you'd like to go back and listen to all of these you can go to my website connectingthegap.net subscribe to one of my podcasting platforms you can see us on youtube and rumble as well and uh, check them all out there's also lots more episodes that were prior to the prophecies of the bible as well some other studies that we've done here connecting the gap so go check out all of that on my website at connectingthegap.net well, I'm out of here until next week. I'm Daniel Moore, your host. Thank you once again. This has been based on a study by Damon Duck, and I hope that you've enjoyed so far. Just remember, God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time, and through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap. <laughs>